Welcome to today's episode of Real Estate Today. My name is Elliot Kulik of Kulik Group Realty. You know, mold has been a major concern in buying and selling homes lately. So what we've decided to do is we brought a leading expert. His name is Roy Fernandez of Engineering Technologies of America. He is an environmental scientist practicing this type of work for the last 23 years. And I think by asking him some really uh, hard questions, I think he'll be able to answer and help us solve some problems that we're all facing. Let's go check him out. Roy, explain to me and everybody at home, what's, what's going on with mold these days? It seems like all of a sudden, everybody's talking about mold, and in addition, you know, it, it seems like it's a real hot topic. So w explain, tell me. Well, mold exists basically throughout the world. It's 20% of the biomass of the entire Earth. Right. So when we discuss mold, we're actually talking about an organism that encompasses the entire world and in our entire environment but it doesn't belong inside our homes. We have to, it does, it does exist in our makeup air, but in rather normal conditions, which is really difficult to explain. Why all of a sudden have people started to discuss mold you know, recently? Well, basically a lot of it's been through litigation that's occurred in Texas. Texas was the, the jump off point for most of the insurance companies where uh, large lawsuits have been, have, were driven the insurance company to set uh, limitations and exclusions on mold and now these uh, it's coming to the forefront where all the all the real estate transactions that are occurring have now the trepidation of is there mold well it's very interesting because a lot of times when people are doing inspections you know most contracts have a standard inspection uh, rider where the seller is obligated to make repairs up to a certain percentage people have gotten and I think companies have gotten so nervous about mold is that they have a separate addendum that make it, which is an as-is rider as it relates to mold. And I think a lot of people have, they don't understand even how to interpret. I mean, if you see some of these reports, you know, they have all these big words, they hand you a report, they don't really know how to interpret it. So well, how do you answer that? Well, I see that a lot. I do, I do see a lot of clients that, that come to me saying, I've, I got this report and I really don't understand what it says. And basically the, the situation that occurs is it's not a report. What they're getting is laboratory analysis with a, a brief explanation without any recommendations, without any remediation protocols, without what is necessary to move to the next step. Mm -hmm. it, it really is important when having a mold inspection to make sure that all of the parts that are necessary for you to move to the next step are included in that report. The, you know, you always hear this word toxic mold all the time. And I think because of a lot of misinformation, you, this is the word. In fact, uh, yeah, I was involved in a contract not too long ago and we got the inspection report back from a general inspector who's you know, re very uh, well respected. And the first thing that the secretary said to my customer was, oh, this house has toxic mold, just like the AMI building. Yeah, in well, well so how, do you, how do you even respond to that? That's a grave misconception, toxic. I mean, the word toxic carries such connotations as, you know, I mean, as hazardous. If, if, have you heard the word hazardous mold being used? I don't think so. But toxicity is in relationship to mold. The fungals, these are, micros, these are microbial organisms. These organisms have a level of pathogenicity that does exist, but it does not necessarily mean that it is a toxic substance. Toxic really has a connotation of a chemical or a, a substance that will cause harm, a caustic right, substance. Right. But mold in its essence is a naturally occurring right. Fungi. I mean, we've talked about that you could leave a piece of bread out and it'll and grow, could, yeah. and it would grow mold. So, and you know, in conjunction with hearing the word toxic, you hear the word spore, remediation, <laughs> and all of these words that I think people are not comfortable or not educated. So, uh, if you were trying, I mean, does it always mean that if a house has mold, that it can't be fixed? No, no, no. That's that's also another misconception. People are saying, well, if the house has mold in it, they have to tear it down. Right. That's uh, almost ludicrous, but 
I won't, we won't go but, there. But, but, yeah. but that's not to, you know, but obviously on the flip side, there are some houses where you have excessive water coming through a roof leak or an area where you could grow mold, which could be harmful. So it doesn't mean, you know, there's two sides to it. Correct. But now when you state, state harmful, harmful to each and every individual, it has to be done on a case by case basis. Right. The physiological makeup of one person will be will differ from another. So in a in a household that has, you know, five individuals, their physiological makeups will be similar but not the same. And just as in studies have shown that um, known allergens, known allergens, hay fever that'll run through one home doesn't necessarily affect each and every individual the same, just as moles and microbials will not affect each and every individual the same. What could cause an allergic reaction in you might not cause any reaction at all in myself. Well, I think what this, you know, and to wrap up this segment, I think that what we need to talk about with, between us and also mm -hmm. everybody at home is, you know, how do you interpret? How do you actually do the right testing? How do you interpret these reports? And I think we'll, in, in our next segment, let's really explain to everyone what is the proper way to inspect, what is the right way to interpret the results, and how can the consumers at home get a level of comfort that they're, if there is mold, how to handle it, or in the case where it's excessive, that maybe it's not the right situation that they should be in. So I think uh, uh, that'll be some useful information that we can uh, give well, to everybody. Well, let's go take a look, and okay, I'll good. show you what an inspection looks like. All right, great. All right. Welcome back to Real Estate Today. I'm Elliot Kulik of Kulik Group Realty. We've already established that it's probably a good idea to do a mold inspection. So let's talk to Roy and see what kind of tools he uses to do a good job. Roy? Uh, the first part of an inspection is that I ask the client to try to maintain the home as sealed as possible due to the fact that when you arrive on, when you arrive to do an inspection, if the doors and windows and everything's open, you have, you've actually commingled the exterior and the interior air and there, you will not which get Which is very common. Right? Which is very common. I no, mean, well, when a home inspector comes right. to do an inspection, I mean, they're inspecting your entire premises. And if they're walking in and out of the house and everything and then take a, then, then do the testing, I mean, how do you know the accuracy of that test? It's, it's difficult. Um, we use a, we use a rotom, we use air sampling, air sampling cassettes. These are, these are one type of cassettes. There's various different air cells and all different types. These are micro fives that I have here on hand. Uh, we also use tape lift samples, which are done on a microscope, which are done on microscope slides that are then placed, there's cellophane tape that's used to lift a sample off the wall, then placed onto a microscope slide and placed into the case and sent off to the laboratory for analysis. Um, we also use a protometer. Protometer is used to measure moisture in walls. To, we find locations that seem that are suitable for, that have had a water intrusion. We can measure the water in the walls using a protometer. We also use air sampling techniques. The air sampling, we calibrate, we calibrate our equipment so that we, ha we can do a statistical analysis on the sample itself. We also now have available thermal imaging equipment. Our thermal imaging equipment is an infrared camera that actually is looking inside the walls and we use differentials in color to locate moisture. It can actually see inside the wall into the interspatial areas of the, of the cavities and show us locations that have high moisture levels. We can do that on the roof and on the exterior of a property. So you don't need also. to cut into the walls. So we don't have, that's right, we don't right. have to be Because that's always the whole issue. Yeah. When they do the testing, you know, they want to cut into the drywall and then, you know, uh, because the sellers really aren't as familiar with this type of testing, you know, it's very intimidating. Someone's cutting their walls, they don't understand it, so that, that's probably a great uh, type of... We also, we also use a, this, we also use swab sampling techniques that are cultured samples. These samples will, will take a, will take a swab of a location and then send it off to the lab for a culture. And this is the same that's done basically when you have a throat culture done or something like that. It's the same procedures. Right. Um, 